Today's episode is sponsored by Liberty Language Services and its new sister company, the Academy of Interpretation, that launched in early 2022. The Academy of Interpretation is an online education and learning platform for the language services industry. The AOI's mission is to expand access to educational courses while establishing a standard of quality and professionalism. They do this by bringing language service providers, content creators, and students together on an online platform that's accessible to everyone. The Academy of Interpretation was founded to address the widespread problem of untrained interpreters working in the field. The AOI offers professional accredited courses for interpreters and serves as a platform for organizations to refer their interpreters for training. The AOI is offering Brand the Interpreter listeners a 10% discount on all courses using the discount code AOI10BTI. This code cannot be combined with any other discounts. But check out the episode show notes for more information about the Academy of Interpretation or visit their website at www.academyofinterpretation.com. Liberty Language Services is a rapidly growing language service company that recently celebrated 11 years of providing language access services. And they are currently hiring freelance interpreters for a variety of languages. To find out more about Liberty or to apply, Check out the episode notes. Lourdes, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I am very, very grateful. Thank you. Oh, no, the pleasure is all mine. And I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation and being able to share it with the audience. So I think they'll be uh, very pleased with uh, today's outcome and, and just being able to hear your story, Lourdes. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for this time with me. Thank you. Absolutely. I'd like to begin our conversation uh, in a way that I start many of the conversations on the podcast with our guests, and it does have to do with going back in time a bit. So if we could potentially hear about Lourdes, the little girl, and uh, what she aspired to be when she grew up. Well, thank you so much. When you go, when you say go back in time, it had to be a lot of time. No. <laughs> but um, I actually, I am very proud to say, like everyone is, is from their country. I am from Guatemala and I am so pleased, just like everyone would be of their country. I was born and raised in Quetzaltenango, Guatemala. My grandparents spoke the language of Quiche and Cachiquel. And when I was little, they used to speak to, to each other in, in Quiche, and I was able to pick up the language from my grandmother and, and the Kachikel from my grandfather. I am able to understand Quiche pretty well. Um, however, and I did speak it for, for some time. However, because that is the language that if you don't use as much, you don't really, um, you may forget the, the, the the, the, the language, so I, I am able to understand but not speak it as much as I, I would like. But I grew up uh, in a home where three languages were spoken as a child. Wow, that's so beautiful. Yes. What is a fun childhood memory of your childhood um, or where you were uh, raised? Well, we were raised in a home where there were lots of children and uh, there were 10 of us at one time, all uh, cousins. And uh, a child my memory is my grandmother. I was raised by her and my grandfather and they enjoyed cooking. Uh, she was always cooking. And one of my fondest memory is uh, being in the kitchen, uh, making tamales. And uh, my grandmother will, we were little and she had these little chairs and we will get on them and start preparing the masa, just working the tamales and there was so many of us and she would say you do that you do that so I learned sequence by her telling us 
you know, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. And, and she, even though we were little, she had us all pretty well trained in what to do next without uh, going into the other people's things. And it, it was, it was a, that was one of my fondest memories being with her and all my cousins. Oh, yes. Grandmas always manage to uh, create fond childhood memories, don't they? Especially if combined with food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what is this? Uh, do you remember ever thinking about your future as a child? And do you remember what your thoughts were, uh, you know, growing up in Guatemala and just thinking about uh, the future? Do you remember at all if that was something that was present at some point? Yes, um, I don't really share this very often, but we, we grew in a very Catholic family. And so I wanted to be a nun. That was my thing. Um, because uh, if we were surrounded by everything, and so I thought nuns really helped people. And so that was my, my desire. My deep desire was becoming a religious sister. And, and we lived one block from the church. So we could hear the bells at all times. And so my, my grandmother was a very religious Catholic woman and she was always praying and saying the rosary. And so, yes, that was my desire to be a nun. Talk to us a little bit about how you made the transition eventually into the profession. Did you get into, uh, you know, schooling or, uh, you mean, you grew up in a trilingual household, but evidently there is English uh, now in your box of languages. So talk to us a little bit about how, how did you transition from Guatemala to the States? Let's begin with that. Thank you. Well, my mother was in the United States the whole time working and while our grandparents were taking care of us. So she came back to, to the Guatemala and told us that we needed to come to the U.S. And so we did. We came with her. And uh, when I came, I spoke um, Spanish. Uh, I understood Quiche, uh, but I did not speak English, but I had a little bit of English. So uh, my mother challenged us to become um, English, to learn English as soon as we got here. So we were placed in a school where hardly anyone spoke Spanish and we are in Los Angeles. So here, um, lots of people spoke Spanish, but she said, you will learn English and you had to learn it in six months. Um, so we were kind of challenged by our mother to do that. So I went to school and uh, we were forced to dive into the English language and having come from a trilingual home, like you said, where I could hear the three languages, it was, I started picking up English and uh, we were practicing and practicing amongst the three of us and my brother and sister. And so I became somewhat a proficient in English and I began interpreting right away at the school for the ladies that worked in the kitchen. Um, you know, I've always liked preparing food. So I, I volunteered in the school kitchen. And so I noticed that they did not speak English and I was speaking a little bit. So I was, I began to interpret for them as they were speaking to other students. So that's how come I got involved. In wow, the... <laughs> that was so smart of you. How old were you when you, uh, when you came and you were in school and all this was happening? I was 17. You came straight to high school? Yes. How was I... that experience coming as a teenager already? I mean, you by then had established friendships, I imagine, in Guatemala and uh, I mean, a pretty set life as a teenager. And of course, that stage, as we all know, is quite a, quite a stage. <laughs> Uh, what was that like for you? Well, it was very hard to leave my country. Um, as you said, I, my dreams were to become a religious and I had already established, um, you know, a bridge to go into that. Um, but um, people may not really understand this, but even though you might be 17, 18, 21, if you're, um, you're a child of, of your mother, so she tells you what to do regardless of whether you say, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, she said, you're doing this and this is what you're doing and this is what we did. So yes, it was uh, very hard to do that transition, but, um, you know, having the support of my mother and also the, that we needed to obey and do what we were told. Um, the transition was made. I, 
I began to to do to I don't want to say assimilate, but some kind understand the culture where I was living. Um, because my grandmother, before we left, she told us that we were here to succeed. And one thing that I I like, I don't know if it's funny, but um, we took the bus from Guatemala. We couldn't afford a plane. So we took the bus. It took us four days. Um, and when we entered the United States uh, with the green card in the San Isidro um, in Tijuana, and we started using the freeway, I saw a sign that said exit, you know, like the exit sign. But, you know, of course, in Guatemala, we don't have that. So I saw it and I thought it said exito, you know, like exito. So I saw all these signs that said exit, exit. So I, I'm thinking of my grandmother saying she told us that we were there to succeed. So when I saw the sign that said exit, I said exito, exito. So succeed, succeed, su succeed. So that's what I saw all those signs everywhere. And I thought, oh, we're here to succeed. So it was like something that kind of pushed me to say, I'm going to honor my grandmother by doing because it was very hard for us, for her to let us go. We grew up with her our whole life. So to honor her, I thought I'm going to learn English and I'm going to succeed. And so did my brother and sister. They both did the same thing. That is such a great story. I, you, I cannot even imagine <laughs> your thoughts at that point. Like, oh, she was right. Everyone here is focused on, on succeeding. <laughs> There's signs everywhere on this thing. I know. <laughs> such a great story. I love that so very much. Thank you for having shared that. I, I thought it was silly, but that's where the first thing I thought is like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so I, we, we don't have those signs where I come from. <laughs> and eventually, of course, you found out that exit did not mean. What you yes, thought yes. Well, I, I, after seeing so many of them, because you, you know, from San Isidro to Los Angeles, it's about a two hour drive. I told my, you know, my my brother, and then somebody said in that kind of Hermes, that means this is how you get out of this the freeway. So salida, you know. <laughs> so, but it already it was in my mind, succeed. <laughs> yeah, it didn't matter. It was that, it was that journey. I think that um, particularly as you're leaving, you know, one one world, your world yes. behind and into your new world. Um I just, I just find that to be such a great story, Lord, this, you know, that, that that's the first impression you get. And in a way, even like you just said, um, it related to your grandmother, you know, to, to be able to honor. So she was still very much present oh, yes. uh, in you and around you as you're making this transition. So uh, that, that's, that's so beautiful. I appreciate you having shared that Thank you, you get to the same. United States and you go into, you know, the, the, uh, American education system, and in, and probably what is one of the most difficult, even for uh, the generations that live here, you know, from kindergarten to high school, because of just just what it means to be a teenager, right? Just in general, and now you are in high school, and um, you know you're learning the language, which you know there is a, a time frame for you to be able to learn it. Because your mother has said, you know, within six months, you need to pick up the language. And so I love the idea or the thought of you um, positioning yourself in a way that would allow you to practice, you know, the interpreting component with the kitchen staff, right? You've identified that kitchen staff needs help. And of course, you know that uh, you need to practice the language yourself in high school. Did it ever occur to you that potentially this could be a profession for you? Or, or when did that come to be for you? No, actually, I did not even know. I'm sorry, to be honest, that that was even a profession. I actually thought that uh, it was a way to prove to my mother that I was following the challenge. But more than that, it's because I want, you know, I love Van Dulce and I was looking for something and I went to the window and I, I noticed the ladies were struggling. So, and then in, in one of the classes, I heard the professor said that to, for extra credit, we could volunteer. And so I thought, you know, I'll ask and see if they'll take me. So I, I, I said, and they introduced me to the kitchen staff and they said, for, for sure. So, and that's how I 
I got into the kitchen at the high school uh, first because they needed someone and I wanted to know that I spoke English, but not enough. Um, I, I, I understood, and that's a lot of our patients that we work with, they understand a lot more than they can say. Mm -hmm. So I understood, I would say 60 to 70%, but I had a very strong accent. Um, and so I got in there just so that I can practice, but then I realized they needed a lot of help. Um, some students were not as gracious, so they will scream and demand and all that. So I thought, you know, because of my background that I wanted to be a nun and I wanted to help, I thought, well, I can help uh, with the English and I can also be nice. And so that's how I, I decided to come in into, to help. I, at the time, did not know that interpreting was a profession. I still wanted to be a nun in my head at the time. So I was trying to, um, you know, make money uh, once I, I, I got hired there in the kitchen so that I, I can have enough money to enter the convent because I had already approached a convent and I was in the work of getting in, and but they needed to have some type of a dowry, which I didn't have. So I was working towards that, uh, not knowing that interpreting was a profession at that time. When did you realize that this was something that you could do professionally um, and, of course, uh, be able to, to, you know, make money out of it? Well, you know, um, I learned English. Well, I, I'm, I'm still learning English, really. I don't think I, we've ever learned enough. Every day I pick up new words. But um, I, um, I had a professor, Mr. Teresa, who was Italian, and he noticed that I was uh, really interested in, in interested in, in in learning English, and he started giving me books, and he kind of took me and other people aside and told us that we could go and interpret for the new students that were coming in into the high school, and so, you know, I, at the time, you know, at the school setting where I was. Uh, we had 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Once you got to 2B, meant that you were you you were uh, an ESL learner, and then you can transition into the classes, into the regular classes. So once I got to the 2B, he put me in a special class where I will help the new ones, the newcomers, to interpret for the new uh, for for the. Uh, teachers, a lot of them were Asian, very nice, nice uh, teachers, and they had some Spanish, but not enough. So I was surprised that they said that I could go and interpret. So I really loved uh, the fact that I understood the culture because I was one of them. And then I understood the language. And so I, I began, um, and then um, the, the same teacher, Mrs., uh, Mr. Teresa, told me that I should go to college. And at the time, I, um, you know, I didn't even know how to. Um, and so he, he helped me and I got into Los Angeles City College, where I continued to develop. I wanted to be a nurse, you know, at the time I, I had. Um, so I went into the nursing program. And I began to get more English. I got into the English 101, English 102, the Shakespeare English getting ready for the nursing. So then one of my neighbors um, was not feeling well. So she asked me to go with her to the county hospital, the big general hospital. So I went with her and while I was there, there was no one to interpret. And so, you know, and she was in a lot of pain. So I got to interpret for the first time in a, in a hospital setting. Up to that time, I had interpreted in the kitchen. And at school with the, you know, with the newcomers. But um, when I went to the emergency room with her, I felt that that was my calling. I felt so, so rewarded to be able to interpret. And then there were two other people that needed services. And I thought, why not? We're here. I'm going to interpret. <laughs> so, and shortly, very shortly after that, because she went back to, to follow up visits, I saw that um, they were hiring and I thought, I wanna work here. It doesn't matter what I do. If they had me cleaning floors, I'll clean floors. I just want to be here. So I applied and um, 
I did get uh, hired, um, you know, I, at the at the hospital, and I began working there in the laundry, um, you know, washing sheets and blankets and towels. And I began to interpret about three months after I got there, and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> Wow, that's so great. I think that that's sometimes, um, you know, the opportunities we, we talk about here um, come to us, right? And in this case, uh, that's exactly what happened. And, and you hadn't felt it uh, as much, maybe that calling when you were interpreting in school, but when you made the connection with uh, patients at a hospital, and you're in that setting, it, you know, it, it now dawns on you that, that this is exactly what you would like to do if you could continue it right and and I always find that the stories are so interesting when we when we hear our calling at the moment you know and then of course the other the other piece is whether or not we're actually going to take action and do something about it because we could hear it but we may not necessarily listen to it. Eventually you make your way into uh, making this your career. Right. And so how did that come to be? Why did you begin that process? Um, was there anything, anything in Los Angeles City College that maybe offered it or did the hospital begin to transition? Uh, I imagine that when you started, you started as the ad hoc interpreter, right? Yes. Um, unless you had training or you went through some training before, how did that be become ad hoc to to, you know, eventually it being your go-to profession, like you became a professional interpreter in that setting. Thank you. You are correct. I started as an ad hoc, not knowing what an ad hoc was. Um, I was very helpful because this is how I was raised. So when I was in the laundry, I was always trying to help. Um, and so my grandmother had taught me to do everything the, the best way I could, even if it was the last thing I would do. So I was folding my sheets, my blankets, thinking of the patients that will come into the emergency room and lay on them and I wanted them to find them crisp and clean and so I was doing everything I could and one day this man came to me and he said come with me and I'm thinking I'm in trouble I did something they want to show you my, I don't know I, I was I was scared so I followed him and when I got to a, a third floor and you have to realize this hospital is huge and it has 19 floors, but at the time, and it was like a city. And so I didn't know anything above the basement. So he took me and I found a patient that needed an interpreter. And uh, I did not speak, I did not speak enough English for sure. And they were trying to communicate and they said, he just left me there and I didn't know what I was going to do. Of course, you're talking about the early 19, in 1980s, early. And so I was there to interpret for this patient whose leg was, uh, uh, this is a young man, maybe early forties. And he was sitting in those old and wooden chairs that we had at the time. And his leg was black. I mean, dark, dark, dark. And it was inflamed and, and um, he, he had developed gangrene because he stepped on a nail, but he was working and he couldn't stop working, but he had collapsed. And so they brought him. So, uh, the doctors were telling him that his leg was going to amputate it in the next couple of hours. And he was saying, no, 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 I'll come back on Saturday. I have to work. And, and so, and they were trying back and forth, back and forth. Well, you can't go back to work. You'll be dead by tomorrow. This gangrene will go up in your body. And, and so I was placed in that situation and um, I felt very um, humbled by the experience because I did not know, and I wanted to do the best job I could to let him know. But um, with my very limited English, I interpreted and what the doctor was saying. I understood everything, but then, um, of course, I told him in Spanish, and he was saying, no, 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 you can't do this. Uh, my wife is pregnant. And, and so he told him his story, and I was using doing everything that we don't do it now. You know, I was pointing, I was omitting, deleting, adding, things that of course we now teach we don't do but at the time I was so desperate I was desperate to convey the message back and forth that um you know and then they had me sign I'm like what am I signing I don't even know and 
and he was signing. I, they said to explain, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm signing. He doesn't know what he's signing, but the, the pressure was there that he was actually very sick. And so then they just took off and they left me. And I'm thinking, what is this? I, I was very, very uh, sad thinking that I didn't do a good job, but I was more sad for him. And I'm thinking, I need to do this more. I need to make sure these people understand the implications. And so I was in college and I was taking anatomy. And so I, I was able to understand the pieces of what the doctor was saying. So I decided at that moment that I will take my, my classes more seriously and I will take more English. And so that was my first experience. I don't remember the patient's name. I named him Juan just because, but that was my first experience. And I fell in love with the profession because but he, because I was Spanish, I spoke Spanish and he, I became his friend right at the moment. And he's like, help me, help me. And I'm saying, hey, I am a laundry worker, sir. I just came from the laundry. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to help you. So uh, the trust that he placed in me at the moment and the trust that the doctors placed in me, thinking that I was saying the right thing, when in fact, I don't know if I was or not, led me to think that I wanted to do this. And I thought the next time I do this, I'm going to do it better. And so I had no training at the time other than being in an anatomy class and, and having some English. So I decided to start looking for training, but you have to see that at the time in the early eighties, there wasn't really a lot of training available for us. And so after that, of course, I went to the laundry, but I had him in my heart and I was thinking of him and other people that may need us. And the next day, Mireya, and the day after, um, I kept being called back into the floors to interpret. And uh, the people in where I worked in the laundry were getting upset because I was leaving my job unfinished, you know, because I was being pulled and I would be gone for two hours, three hours, but my work's still the same. So um, when I came back to my station, my, my job was waiting for me. So I was like a dual role worker, if mm -hmm. you will. And, and so about four months after, um, a position opened up in the medical records where it, I will go out to a window in the first floor, now no, no longer in the basement, where people will come to me and I will, my job will be follow the white line to the pharmacy, follow the red line to the, to the emergency, follow. So it was like following lines, that was my work. But at the same time, nurses or other people will come and say, hey, can you interpret for this? Can you interpret for that? So I began to find myself interpreting without you know, going. And so later on, uh, about a year into it, I uh, saw a posting in the social work department for a department secretary. And I thought, you know, what are the chances? <laughs> I'll apply, you know, all they can say is no. And, and so I apply and, um, but before that, um, I I was work I was going to school to become a, a nurse. But then there was a position of a nursing attendant, so I applied for the position and I got it. I got in as a nursing attendant in the diabetes clinic, and so instead of being a nursing attendant, I was an interpreter. I interpreted all day long for the physicians, nurse practitioners, and then. For some reason, they thought I was doing a good job. So they, they sent me to other clinics. Specifically, I remember the Burn Clinic, B-U-R-N, um, where I would be stationed at that clinic Mondays and Fridays where people who were severely burned um, and a lot of them were Hispanics. And so I not only exercised my nursing but I also interpreted. And it was very painful to see a lot of them were purposely burned. One case, this young man from El Salvador was, turned, was thrown into this boiling tartar and he had burns in 85% of his body. And I was interpreting for him for months. And so that's how my career kind of evolved, you know, being a, 
a nursing attendant in different clinics, and then transitioning into the department secretariat in the social work department, where um, as a social work, um, you know, in the secretary, I was spending most of my days in the hematology oncology clinics. AIDS, when the AIDS epidemic broke, I was there interpreting at the clinic. And so that's how I evolved the, my, um, my director, she was from Colombia and it were now ending the eighties. And uh, she was kind enough to start looking for resources so that I can train. And so we came across the Bridging the Gap. Um, that was in the, um, you know, early, early um, 80s. And so she, she introduced me to that. And then, um, you know, I was working there. And, and then uh, I came across this Mount San Antonio College Healthcare Interpreter Program where I went to the class in 2000, in, you know, in the, in, you know, early 2000, but before that, all throughout the 90s, um, I'm sorry, the 90s, I did the bridging the gap and I stayed with the social work department. And then um, there was an opening and like you said, opportunities. I was always looking to help and I saw an opportunity at Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center. And again, I thought, and my supervisor, Lydia, she encouraged me to apply and she said, they, they are going to use you as an interpreter. She said, you're going to be working with the speech and language. And so I applied and I went to an interview with several 20 people and um, I, I got hired. I got hired and uh, I was so blessed because it was one of the best things that happened to me. And um, they were kind enough to send me to Pasadena City College where I took the one year training for the speech and language pathology assistant so that I could work with the uh, stroke patients because a lot of the therapists, very nice, nice, beautiful people. They were monolingual, you know, so they needed the interpreter to be well-trained and understand the concept of speech pathology. So. I went to the training and I spent eight years working directly with them, um, with the victims of stroke um, and also brain injury and other injuries of the brain. And so I developed more the skills of understanding and being very uh, the faithful echo that we call it. So that's, uh, I was there. Um, learning and every day, you know, I learn more and more from the patients, from the families. So that's how can I, my career evolve, um, always looking to help that. That was my underlying thing is the more I know, the more I will help because I will be trained and then I can do a better job. And I have a lot to thank my supervisor, uh, Ms. Shabtai, because she saw that I wanted to help. And so even though she said, I hate to lose you as our secretary, you need to move on and do more. So that's why she encouraged me to go to Rancho Los Amigos. And you know, from there, I became the first uh, interpreter of the Los Angeles County, the first, because then in, in the year 2000, um, 2001, uh, they had the, the first opening and I applied and I got it, you know, and it was then that I, I went to school at the Mount San Antonio College in its interpreter program, which was an 18 month program. I was uh, in the second graduating class. And then, you know, it just took it from there. Yeah, it just continued from there. I mean, it, it's, I love hearing how the, the progression, you know, be, begins and, and it, how it evolves, because I feel that oftentimes, you know, it's whether we are looking for the opportunities ourselves or the opportunities present themselves. Um, I always love hearing how the mentors around you um, are always there to guide you 
uh, and, and be able to point you in the right direction, at least, you know, of course, it's always up to us as the individuals to take the opportunity to take that action. Um, but it sounds like you were doing exactly that, navigating your way through uh, the experience and, and also, you know, being able to take the, the trainings, like a lot of these uh, uh, trainings that were being offered that you were so open to continue learning. When did you decide I'm not going to do nursing anymore. When did that stop? You know, it's, uh, it's kind of sad because I really did want it to be a nurse. Uh, having wanted to be a nun, I thought nursing was the next big thing. But, you know, I got married to Mr. Wonderful Julio Serna. And so we, he was actually going to school himself. And so he had a lot more chances because he had already started his career in El Salvador. And so I thought that he needed to go to school, you know. And so he um, he went to school after working a full day and, you know, we started having our two wonderful children. And so I chose for him to, to continue his education. And me, you know, of course, we needed the two working fam uh, incomes, but... Um, I, we had our small children and he was going to school. So I kind of put it away and I'm thinking, I'm going to go back once you finish, I told him. But, you know, he became an engineer, a wonderful. Um, and so I postponed it so that he can go. And because he had a lot more chances because he was already advanced in his career in El Salvador. And, uh, and then, you know, we have our two small children and then I thought there's really no space uh, if, if one of us is going to graduate school and the other. So even though we had our mother-in-law, uh, Rosa, with us, I still wanted to be there for my kids uh, because I spend the whole day at work. So I'm thinking, why would I go at night? And so he, uh, that's when I decided to, to not continue the, the career, thinking that I can go back later, which I never did. Um, but, you know, at work, I was getting all these opportunities. So right. that's how it's happened. Yeah, like it, like it was basically, you know, saying it's OK, because there's going to be plenty in, in, in this realm, in this area. Right. For you, you, yes. you worked in um, I mean, some of these experiences in the hospital, even before your training, you were in departments that were, um, you know, uh, pretty uh, high trauma. Um, type of encounters, um, situations that uh, particularly for uh, an individual that has not had necessarily the training with regards to, you know, and these types of interpreting encounters, um, I imagine there was a high level of intensity and a high level of feeling, um, you know, this high emotional type of encounters through the years that that serves as experience for uh, potentially other um, high trauma type of encounters. We fast forward into uh, 2020 and the uh, pandemic that we go through and the situations that many of our uh, uh, LEP families encounter when they enter uh, emergency rooms, uh, medical settings due to the pandemic. Uh, we've heard the stories of others in which, you know, the difficulty was already present because of everything that was going on. And then you add a layer or another barrier, which is a language barrier. And uh, the situation widens even more. What would you say, Lourdes, has been the biggest challenge in your career uh, in terms of, of the profession itself, um, what, what did you find very challenging and potentially even upsetting to you? Well, uh, to be very honest, one of the things that I found challenging is um, if you're talking about uh, forward to 2020, when the pandemic started, um, if we, I, I have a privilege to, to be uh, over the phone interpreting video remote. And one of the things that I found very hard is that some of the encounters that we've had over the phone or in video, I wish they would have been in person mm -hmm. uh, for the individual, I would say, because, um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the Zoom started and we were, um, you know, doing a lot of telehome visits and so forth. And I noticed that 
a lot of the patients were so challenged by technology. And um, so we, we will have like 15 minutes for a phone call and we spend 10 minutes trying to get the patient to figure out what button to press for the camera to come on or what button and how do you get to the Zoom link and so forth. So I felt so bad because myself, I am very technology challenge. I have to be honest. It's all my son's fault. You know, he will do everything for me. So I never really <laughs> learned. And so I was, and when he, you know, left, I had to learn, um, you know, and I'm still learning, to be honest. My students can tell you that technology has taken the best from me. But um, one of the things that I felt so bad was our patients and I see them like, I don't see it. I don't, and calling Rosa, come here. And so they were having a hard time with technology when we did televisits. And also when we had to call families and tell them your son is being disconnected from life support and, or, you know, calls like that, that were so difficult or a call <clears throat> that, um, that I always will have, even up to now, where um, a lady's husband um, was being disconnected because, um, you know, the COVID has taken over his body in such a way that they've done everything they could. And I remember the doctor saying to her that her patient, her husband's body was so large um, that they couldn't prone him. They put they couldn't put him face down because his body was too large. And so I explained that to her. And she was like, Oh, he was always eating the wrong thing. And and I told him he was too too large and so forth. And so I have a, a situation like that in, in my family. So I took it so it, it hurt me so much as a person to hear the pain. And he was dying. And so we having to hear that ourselves uh, on the video or the audio and then having to say that to the family, sometimes calling Mexico, Honduras, my own country, and telling them that their loved ones were, you know, had been disconnected or the ventilator stopped working on its own or things like that. It was very, very hard. I mean, I am a crier. I cry very easy. And so I, I, is my friend I always have a cup of tea next to me and um, of course you know have, having wanted to be a nun for I pray I mean that's the only thing that got me through it is that in my heart I was praying for each and every one of my patients that I was working with and the providers that were working with them so that was I think that was very challenging for me to to be the voice be, saying your husband just died your mother is going to be placed on a ventilator um, your son is not going to make it even with the ventilator. So things like that were, I think I found them very challenging because I felt for the people on the other side, you know, hearing that. And so, and for the providers to have to say this. So that those were very challenging times. I am so glad that now uh, we don't have to do those calls as frequent, although we are unfortunately having going back to some of those goals. I hope that answered your question. Oh, completely. Yes, absolutely. Because it, it, it only proves, you know, that the experiences, even through the years, even having had those experiences with the, this uh, high trauma encounters at the hospital, uh, it's still, it's still impactful. It doesn't matter the experience that you're bringing in from other high trauma situations, um, that every encounter is different, that every situation is different. Um, I'm, I'm, interested in, in knowing and understanding how you as an individual dealt with, you know, the aftermath of that phone call, because uh, potentially maybe you went from one call to the next yes. uh, with everything that was happening. So at the end of the day, how did you take care of yourself? You know, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, I prayed. I, I have to say that if it wasn't because I, I had my rosary next to me and I, have you know several pictures here that really remind me of God's mercy I wouldn't have been able to there were times when I thought you know this will be my last call um, but um, I saw the need and I saw the need that the, the providers had to make that phone call and get someone answer the call right away 
And I sometimes providers will say, oh, I've been in the line waiting for an interpreter for so many minutes and so forth. So I did not want to, to have it while I was there. I pushed myself thinking that they needed me and I wanted to be there. And consequently, at the same time, when the epidemic was the hardest in September uh, of 2020, my neighbors to the left and to the right, they both died of COVID, three, three days, one from the other. And then my parish priest also collapsed while saying mass, also of COVID, all in one week. And so I was living through that. Um, one of the calls that I received, um, my neighbor on my left side, on my right side, had died that morning while sitting in his living room. And I had spoken with him that, you know, we, we would go out and walk our dogs. And, and I had spoken with him. And then he, he was one of those people that just died just like that, you know. And so I known him for 20 years. So I had the pain of his passing and I could hear a lot of noise because I work from home. Um, you know, I, I, the, all the family gathered there and I was interpreting that for people thousands of miles away from me. And I was living through the situation myself. And so, and then a couple of days later, my neighbor on the other side died. And uh, she was one of my best friends because she was a great cook. And she will always call me and say, Lourdes, I made pozole, Lourdes. And so she died uh, in the hospital. And so personally, myself, I was feeling that through my neighbors. Um, and so it was uh, very difficult because I had the feeling myself. But I also felt compelled to be there for the providers because they, I did not want them to wait nine minutes on the line when they had a patient dying or something. So I made myself available. I remember that I did not take a single day off because I wanted to be there for them. And I worked as much as I could. And um, I was taking chamomile tea, you know, tea de manzanilla. It, it's very soothing. My grandmother used to give us that all the time. So I had it with me um, all the time and my rosary. And just thinking, I want to be there for you. Um, as an interpreter as much as I can. And you are right, the calls were coming back to back. And in my company, we only work with medical calls. We don't take any other calls. So, you know, every call came from an emergency or an intensive care for at least a month. Wow. First and foremost, Lourdes, um, thank you for having shared that and being open. And I, I sincerely you know, uh, feel your loss and, and I'm sorry, so sorry for, for the several losses that you were personally having, um, in your surroundings. I, I cannot imagine going through that personally. And, and in addition, uh, at work, seeing so much loss and having to deal with so much loss and difficulty. Um, and so thank you so much for, you know, being, part of Thank such you. an important process and especially for these families, um, you know, that otherwise wouldn't have had, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to communicate directly with either the, the, the doctor, you know, or um, their family members. So uh, thank you for, for having shared oh, those yeah. stories. Thank Very you. much appreciated. Um, I'd like to move into the fact that you do now teach. We heard you yes. earlier mention about teaching. Um, and so now you, you are giving back by, by means of teaching. Talk to us a little bit about um, you know, uh, what you focus on now that you teach and what you give away to your students now. What, what, what is it that you focus that you want them to take away about the profession? Thank you. You know, you are right. I have been blessed beyond means to have the opportunity to be an instructor. And when you talk about opportunities, this is something that I always wanted to do, but I thought that only very important people do it because my, my trainers were very highly, you know, Julie Burns and, you know, very highly regarded trainers. But uh, I began training in 2005 when I was taking the Connecting Worlds training um, and then uh, another training put out by LA Care. And one of the instructors there, very nice lady, she developed some kind of allergy during lunch. And so 
uh, she 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 couldn't continue. And we were in our third day out of five days. And she, she said, Lord, let's take over. I'm like, take over what? So at the time, I had been helping her passing out flyers and giving examples. And then she just told me to just follow the script. And I did. I I took on the training from like 12 to 5 that day. And she said, oh, you did wonderful. She, you have so much passion. And so it turned out that she couldn't continue. So they sent someone else. Um, but then she said that I will co-train with her. And so I was like, wow, I cannot believe that. Uh, all I did was talk about what I do, which is interpreting. So I took on the training. And then after that, um, it had been, it, 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 I was offered to take the train, the trainer uh, for bridging the gap and connecting worlds. And so I, you know, did not really have a lot of money, but I found money to go to the trainings in Santa Rosa and other places here in California. And so I became a trainer and I've been training ever since. Uh, in, 2000, um, in 2009, I was very, um, no, in 2007, I became incredibly blessed when I got a phone call from the, own, the same place where I graduated, Mount San Antonio College, saying that their training trainer had become sick and did I want to come and interview for the trainer position? And I thought, well, this is a college I graduated from you. They said, come. So I, got, I, I, I went through the interview. I have to say that that day was raining like you have no idea. It was raining. I don't know how I got there, but I got there. And, uh, you know, I interviewed and they gave me the position of a lead instructor, adjunct professor for the training that I just graduated from in 2001. So I took on the training uh, as a lead trainer from 2007 to 2011 until the program closed. And so I told my students and I continue because I, I have the privilege of being a trainer even now for interpreter ed. And I lead the 60 hour training on Zoom. And, you know, we, we, of course, we teach the modalities, the roles, the modes, the ethical principles. We go over most of the organs and systems and so forth. But what I, you can speak to one of my students that um, what I teach is passion, love, respect for the individual and to be faithful to the message. Because I, when I came, I, I had interpreters that purposely did not interpret what I said or did not interpret correctly. And I feel that that is such disrespect for someone to place their trust in you and then you turning around and saying the wrong thing. So I teach them and I always tell them when the class is over, I said, even if you did not get the, the cardiovascular or, or the neurology system all down, but if you, if you, because you can get that later, you know, with practice, but if you, if you understand how much respect you need to have for each encounter that you go through, how much this patient is trusting you, he's saying, hey, Mireya, you're an interpreter. You will say, if I have pain, you're going to convey the pain the way I say it, not the way you think I should say it. So that's what I convey to my students, the respect that they need to give to each patient that they come across to prepare themselves physically, emotionally, and just to be there, to be mindful to that encounter. So that's what I teach besides, you know, everything that goes into that encounter. That's amazing. And I think it's so great and a, a wonderful way of you being able to uh, to still give back. You know, you mentioned in the beginning that your desire was to help people. And yes. I think you you are helping even more people, uh, not to say that you wouldn't have helped a lot of people uh, in in your original chosen profession as a nun. But I think that, you know, if if it had to do with with love and passion and respect, um, that you're able to do that more so not just with your patients, but also with the students that will eventually be connecting with those future patients. And what a beautiful way of being able to spread the love and the passion and the respect that, that our patients, that our LEP families deserve in every encounter that, that they're in. So thank you for having shared that uh, so much, Lourdes. I really appreciate that. Uh, as we get to our close, uh, the close of our session, uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of last questions. Uh, first and foremost, 
foremost, what are your hopes for the future of interpreting? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My hopes is that um, the profession, this is a, a profession that's evolving, as you know. Um, when I started, there was no certification. We were all ad hocs. And anybody that spoke the language was an interpreter. So I am so grateful uh, that time has gone and we have now training programs. We are able to test and make sure that the individual that goes out there to interpret is trained and prepared to deliver the message faithfully. So my hope is that we continue evolving. I know that some hospitals are now requiring a bachelor's program, um, to a bachelor's degree to, to um, you know, to uh, work there. So my hope is that we will become the profession as any other profession, you know, like attorneys, nurses that need to take the board. So the highly, highly skilled individuals so that the profession can be recognized at the way it is. When I started interpreting, you know, we will go and then they will dismiss us and uh, we will not know the outcome. But now, you know, we are recognized more as the interpreter, but I think we need more recognition as far as being the professionals. I want the, the world to see us as professionals and for us to behave as ones and you know, get the education, um, get the certifications. Um, I am privileged to have both CMI and CHI, but I think we need more um, because individuals have to be highly, highly trained to be able to deliver the message faithfully. So that's my hope is that we continue to evolve as the profession that we are and be more recognized as the professionals that we are that, and that we serve the patients with love and passion and professionalism. Thank you, Lourdes. I definitely agree uh, completely, 100%. What is a recommendation that you would like to share with the future language professional, the new generation of language professional, what would you like to share with them as you've experienced through the years in the profession? Thank you. I would like for them to know that they need to get themselves trained, that they need, uh, they need to continue evolve. Uh, once I've known interpreters that get their credentials and they stop, they need to continue going to continuing education. They need to continue evolving with the profession and get themselves certified, trained, continue their learning, and attend webinars, seminars, conferences, belong to professional organizations, and just be there with the patient, for the patient, with all their hearts. And, um, you know, look out for opportunities for growth. Um, I never really went out looking. I mean, I was always ready, uh, but um, there's so many out there, especially in this country that embraced us immigrants. There's so much there. We just have to be ready to embrace it when it comes, you know. And so continue learning, evolving, and most of it, continue serving. And, you know, it will come. It's just, it's, I think once you give it with all your heart, it may come back in ways that you don't expect it, but it will come back, at least the satisfaction that you serve that patient well because you educated yourself. Thank you so much, Lourdes. I very much appreciate your recommendation. Lastly, where can our listeners find out more about you and the work that you do? Well, I appreciate your time. I am on LinkedIn as Lourdes Serna. Um, that's uh, where... I guess my professional um, profile is, and, and I don't really do a lot of Facebook, but uh, LinkedIn, it's where I, where I am. And thank you. Yeah, no, I'll make sure to, to include the uh, link to your LinkedIn profile on the episode notes in the event that people would like to connect with you. Yes. It has been an absolute pleasure uh, it, and privilege to have in, had the opportunity to talk to you, speak with you, and having you share your story on this platform, Lourdes. I'm ever so grateful, and I feel that other people are definitely going to connect with you and your story, and uh, you're going to drive passion into them and it, connect with others in an even broader reach uh, just because you were willing to share your story on this platform. So thank you so much for the opportunity. 
Thank you, Mireya. Thank you for taking the time. It was great meeting you at the conference we had a couple of weeks ago. Thank you for thinking of me as someone that could possibly share their story. I was like, what? <laughs> I don't know how they want to know about me, but I thank you so much for what you do. You do so much as well. And thank you for sharing that our stories. We all interpreters have a lot to share. So thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs>